Um, hi, Martha. Thank you so much for helping with my project. Uh, could you say a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Marta Schantz. I live in the Washington, D.C. area. I'm 33 years old, and I work in sustainability, and I don't know much about the moon, but it's cool. <laughs> that sounds good. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the sustainability work that you do? Yeah. So in my day job, I I make the business case for green buildings. So everything from energy efficiency to renewable energy to um, like connecting with the utility grid um, and everything in between for all building types. So I'm, I'm all about sustainability and green buildings like that lead plaque. Uh, if you see on, on green buildings, that's, that's my jam. Oh, fantastic. Um, well, wh where do you see the biggest opportunities in terms of buildings and sustainability? For buildings and sustainability, the next frontier is net zero. The idea that at a building level, you only use as much energy as you create on site. And so that can be with solar panels, wind power, geothermal, what have you. And so to do that, like buildings are only so big, so you can really only fit so much renewable energy on the building. So the building itself has to be super energy efficient as well. And so it's that balance that that's the future. That's net zero. It's where it's going. Um, lighting versus temperature control. Like, uh, what's the? Ooh. So, because lighting has gotten so efficient, like LED lighting, super efficient. Lighting only takes up about, on average, twenty percent of a building's energy consumption, whereas HVAC, like heating, ventilation, air conditioning, takes up like forty percent or so. So. The HVAC side definitely is where there's a bigger opportunity to reduce. And so there's a lot of like interesting uh, temperature sensor and controls and opportunities to like have impressive, like efficient motors on the fans for the thing, uh, for the equipment. So I get jazzed up about that. That, that is uh, pretty neat. I, I know in my household, um, well, we have like a two story house with like uh, a unit for upstairs and downstairs and we have eight mm. people in our house right now oh, wow. um and we have like this big central uh area and the people upstairs are usually too hot so they're putting the ac way down people downstairs are a little bit too cold and occasionally they turn on the heater and you have like this oh, nice no. little dynamic simultaneous heating and cooling is not not ideal not ideal of course but. in texas you just have to open the door to get the heating part usually oh, gosh well, unless you're in a, a deep freeze, in yes. which case things are different. <laughs> that is true. Uh, but insulation, uh, that's, uh, I mean, uh, thermoses are amazing insulators. Uh, I mean, you could take like hot soup or hot coffee and it stays hot all day long. How come we don't see something like that in buildings? That is a great question. I really like that analogy. So in the buildings world, we call it the building envelope. So everything like on the outside of a building and for it to be as efficient as possible, they say you want a tight building envelope. So like all of the windows to be sealed, all of the doors to have nice seals and seams. You don't want the, um, the material itself to let air through uh, or to even just let temperatures through. You just want it to be insulated. So uh, high quality insulation is key as well as um, just high efficient windows. Some folks don't think about the windows, but those also let a lot of, kind of heat and cold through. So a lot of high efficient envelope is important. There's a building certification called Passive House, which isn't just for residential, it's for all buildings um, that specifically focuses on a tight envelope as like the key solution for efficient buildings. And that's growing in popularity. Um, that, I mean, it's, it's really awesome. I mean, whenever uh, I think about humanity branching out uh, beyond the earth, you know, the ability to keep humans uh, you know, and that that Goldilocks range of temperature in for these very extreme environments uh, is going to be key. And you know, I mean, and has direct application to buildings here on Earth. It totally does. I'm really curious for the moon. Like, can we do geothermal on the moon? Does the moon have a hot core that we can pull heat from? This is how little I know about the moon, but it would be cool if we could get all of our coal miners to the moon to drill holes, well, not coal miners, natural gas drillers, to the moon to drill like deep wells to get geothermal jobs. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the on the, the sun facing side of the moon, I think it's something like uh, over 100 degrees Celsius. And on the code, on the, the dark side of the moon, it's like uh, 
you know, I think negative 100 degrees. Uh, or, I mean, it's like extreme. Oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't know it was that. Wow. Temperatures. But, um, you know, the moon re oh. revolves really slowly. It takes 28 Earth days for the moon to rotate completely. Oh, really? Wow. Um, so potentially you could have like a mobile um, like settlement that's right there at the Terminator with one part of it in the cold side and part of it in the hot side and, and kind of uh, and take it just advantage rolls. of the difference it and just, just rolls roll. with the earth. Yeah. <laughs> but potentially. That's fascinating. That's so interesting. Or it could be like, I imagine like hills and mountains get in the way, but you could have it elevated. You know how like in Chicago, they have the elevated uh, metro line. You have the elevated solar panel line that just goes around the entire earth. That would be fascinating. The infrastructure would be a challenge, but I mean, that's going to be a challenge no matter what. Yeah, it's all about automation and, and uh, creating systems that are able to get the material, turn into useful stuff and, and build stuff. Without but it's humans. not even that they have to be able to withstand those temperatures like right now the pacific northwest is having this extreme heat um, disaster right and so with with the highest temperatures they've seen ever like over 100 degrees in seattle and infrastructure is melting and so but that's 100 degrees fahrenheit so for, to get 100 degrees celsius that's what boiling right that's 212 degrees fahrenheit and so that like you've just got to have such stronger materials to be able to handle both like the brittlest of colds and the hottest of heats and still like function that's hard yeah i was Whoa. just uh uh I, like I siding on homes is melting like the wires that hold um utility lines are like coming apart yeah it's that bananas. could be really really bad with the uh, insulation and, and uh, you know, and it's like a positive feedback situation, you know, I mean, like you have electrical line that like an extension cord that starts heating up and then insulation starts melting, then you start having conductivity between uh, the yeah, two wires becomes, and then it becomes a, a fire. A safety issue. Yeah, totally. Oh dear. So when humans go to the moon in 2024, they don't plan to like settle on it, do they? They just want to explore? Yeah, I, this is pretty much a rerun of the Apollo program, except with, um, you know, newer equipment uh, for astronauts instead of three international partners and uh, commercial uh, partners uh, providing part of it. And with the idea that this is sort of like the beginning steps to a more sustained um, exploration development. Fascinating. OK, so it's exploration and development. That makes sense. Interesting. Well, since the last time we went to the moon, we discovered that there's actually um, frozen water in some craters near the poles of the moon, um, because you know the Earth has a pretty good tilt. I mean, just places on the Earth during the summer it's daylight twenty four seven, right. and in the winter it's uh, uh, night twenty four seven. But but the moon only has like a one degree tilt with respect to the yeah. sun, and it has like these deep craters and no atmosphere. And so over billions of years water molecules have gotten trapped in these really cold places and kind of huh. resource people are excited about. Is that where the, the moon explorers are gonna go then to those water craters? Um, yes, the, these are at the poles and the, the goal is to send uh, the astronauts to the south pole of the moon. Cool, interesting. Wait, but you didn't answer my question. For, have you heard of geothermal? the this concept where you like drill really deep to harness the heat of the of the earth's core in order to heat your buildings i have does, heard of it yeah okay does the moon have a like a, a hot core um so i i think there's a lot we don't know but oh, the, current, okay. the, the current understanding is that uh, the moon does not have an active hot car core oh that's right unfortunate now. but but you know we shouldn't replace uh uh, kind of like our assumptions with real knowledge. Yeah, maybe we should go and is, find out. Is there wind on the moon? Is that a weird question? I, I don't even know. You said there's no atmosphere. So is, is there wind? Like, can we get wind turbines on the moon? Uh, no wind on the moon. At least no nothing wind. that's, uh, even on Mars, the, the wind, the air is like extremely thin. It's like even thinner than it is on the peak of the tallest mountains here on Earth. Wow. It's, so it's really, it's solar, solar or bust, I guess, plus battery storage. We'll have to have a lot of battery storage. 
and nuclear. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's slightly more dangerous, but 24 seven power for sure. I mean, it takes, it takes like 20 years to build a nuclear power plant in the United States on land, on earth. So that would be a big deal to, to bring nuclear up to the moon. Do the, do the spaceships have nuclear well, on them? I, so, I mean, you have like several different um, kind of, uh, it, I mean, so a radioactive uh, decay uh, powers, uh, it can be used in many different ways. Uh, there is a particular um, isotope that uh, decays and produces heat that's actually used to power the rovers that are on Mars. Um, so, um, you know, you can have really small uh, kind of energy producing um, wow. things, so. Oh, I had no idea. How about that? Small nuclear reactors, I get that. Well, not really a reactor. No, not uh, reactors. Because um, it's basically uh, just uh, the isotope decaying, producing heat, as opposed to it actually uh, being like one of these uh, nuclear reactors, but it's Huh. Fascinating. All right. But uh, so, where, where did you, I mean, how long have you known that we we're planning to go to the moon in 2024? Oh, not really until your, until your interview on, on the Celestial Citizen podcast. I, I am not, not a moon person, although I think it's cool. It's just not my, my day to day. And so I was listening to this podcast because, um, the the podcast host's husband and I went to college together and I was like oh cool podcast I will listen and then I learned all about your your interview series of taking you know interviewing someone every day about humans going to the moon in 2024 that is so soon so soon it uh, is 1277 yeah. days or 87 days but uh who's counting <laughs> <laughs> you're counting that's great yeah. I I um yeah I I did not know I knew about Space Force. That's really all that kind of space has been in the news lately with Trump creating. Well, and that's not even a new thing necessarily, but it's the newest thing that's been on my news radar about space and the moon. But, uh, but what do I don't. I don't even know if Space Force is doing anything, so we'll ignore that. Well, I, maybe maybe not too quickly. I, I'm just kind of oh, curious really? is, in, uh, about okay. Space Force and your thoughts on that. Are you like? wow, we're really uh, preparing for the future. You're like, what the heck is this? Uh, yeah, the second one. Like, what the heck is this? Like, what are you doing? We have the Air Force. We have NASA. Why do we need Space Force? That's my take on it. I, but I, that's about as much research as I've done on it. I, I know there's a, a, a Netflix show with Steve Carell called Space Force. Have you, I, you're nodding, like maybe you've watched it. I have not watched it, but I hear it's like a little too close to accurate. <laughs> of how like dysfunctional the real space force is and so i i don't have a lot of confidence yeah were, um, were you excited about it um i, I was kind of ambivalent um so mm. i mean there's sort of like two thoughts one is um you know why are we preparing for war in space when we should be really kind of preparing for peace in space and a chance oh. for it to come together um yeah so that, that was one thought I had and that I, I think people look at like Star Trek, you know, I mean, essentially that is a military space power that's seen as being very benevolent and good for the universe. And so I think a lot of people are like, oh yeah, we should start building something like that. But yeah. Is that, isn't that kind of what the ISS is all about? Of, about uh, getting people- Yeah, like together. coming together and having a joint a joint station. There are lots of different of like different countries astronauts there, right? Yeah, I think it's about uh, fifteen different countries are involved. Yeah. Uh, a lot that of people in nice. Europe. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and actually, you know, that's one of the things. Can you imagine having like the UN in orbit, and you have all these delegates from around the world meeting, in like this facility that's orbiting the globe, and they're looking down at the Earth. That's cool. That's cool. I think that's neat. Uh, I don't the, I don't know if that'll happen in our lifetime. Do you, will it? No. I don't know. That sounds that sounds like a movie. I don't know if that sounds like real life yet to me. Well, I, I have a question. Um what do you think would uh take to make it happen? What would it take to make that happen? 
Um, I think a, a devastated earth. I, I think we would have to have, so climate change is happening, right? I, I deal in green buildings, I see this, and climate adaptation is something that we're all forced to deal with. Hotter hots, colder colds, wetter wets, drier droughts, um, sea level rise, just everything is extreme with weather these days, more than it ever has be, been before. And if the earth gets to a point where like we, climate change continues to become a problem where the earth keeps rising in temperature and humans don't pull back our impact on the environment enough, then we'll get to a point where we've hit irreversible damage. And then it's like, well, wait, can I swear? Oh, oh yeah, go for it. Okay. Well, it's like, oh shit, what do we do now? I guess we need to go to space. And so like, that's, that's what I think. I think the earth needs to get so bad that they're like, well, fuck, we've got to get out of here. Let's, let's go to space. Let's figure out our solutions. And I don't know that so i i look at it as more of a an, an out it's like an out i guess well like earth is screwed so let's go to space and figure out our solution for the moon is that is that too cynical i don't know that's that's where i'm at well rather cynical or not i would say it's not uncommon a lot of people mm. have that same perception that is some type of uh, escapism or some type of kind of shirking a responsibility to earth or abandoning earth i, I think the and I think some of it may be that for sure. Um, but um, the, the, the reality of the situation is, is that regardless of how we mess up the earth, the earth would still be probably more um, accommodating and habitable for humans than any other place in the solar system. And so um, it would be far easier to create a space colony on earth than it would be in some other place in the solar system. Mm. Oh, interesting. Well. Have you watched the movie Xenon Girl of the 21st Century? Um, you know, I learned about that through one of these interviews. Uh, and <laughs> I watched part of it, right? Uh, so I watched the part where she gets exiled to the Earth. But I unfortunately, I didn't make it past that. So they live on this, like, space colony. I don't think it's on the moon. I think they're just in a spaceship orbiting Earth, if I remember correctly. It's a That's Disney right. movie. It was fantastic. Probably one of the best Disney movies I watched as a kid. And... And maybe it's that then, like it's not that people go to the moon, but they just live forever on a on a very very large spaceship. That would oh man, I don't know. I really like the outdoors. I feel like that would get so tight, cramped, even if it is a big one. But I mean, uh, you remember? Have you heard of Biosphere Two? Is that a movie? Yeah, uh, well, no, it's a, a facility in Tucson, Arizona. In the late uh, 1980s, early 1990s, um, this uh, hermetically sealed um, a facility was created uh, with mm -hmm. several different biomes to replicate like the Earth's uh, system. So you like had a tropical forest biome, a grassland biome, a okay. desert biome. And uh, eight people went in there for two years and lived completely isolated, not isolated in terms of human contact, but isolated in the sense that um, they leave. were completely recycling the air. Um, they wow. had to grow all their own food. Uh, all their waste had to be recycled. Um, it, it, they, they, there was some controversies around it. Um, uh, you know, in fact, there's a, a movie called Biodome that was kind of uh, inspired uh, based upon it that's completely, uh, takes a, you know, a, a funny view of it. But, you know, you could see creating huge facilities like that I mean, like in Dubai, for example, they have, um, you know, a ski slope in Dubai, uh, you know, so this is the middle of the desert and they right. have a building where it's like cold on the inside and they have fake snow. Whoa, that's blowing my mind. So, I mean, yeah, people are doing it now. That's interesting. Wow. So, I mean, uh, if we messed up this earth, I see us creating more and more uh, bigger, bigger artificial environments like this for mm -hmm. humans to sort of, I mean, it, it essentially is like AC on a global scale. Uh, yeah, so. yeah. It's, oof. that just sounds depressing though. I really hope we don't get to that point. I hope we can just explore the moon because we can, right? That's the dream where we figure out the climate issues and we're able to address address climate change so we don't hit irreversible damage wouldn't that be nice and then it's like oh the moon let's keep exploring that let's see what's going on there just because we can because we're not you know dire straits and the world's on fire 
So that would be nice. The, the only type of escapism that makes sense uh, from a space perspective is to get away from your fellow humans. Interesting. Uh, it, you know. Are a lot of astronauts introverts? Um, I think, uh, you know, mo at least NASA, and I imagine other space agencies uh, see astronauts as being public figures. And mm, I think they fair. almost uh, require them to be uh, at least have a public presence, being able to do shows and, and stuff. Mm. Well, I guess extroverts like to escape people sometimes too. But uh, I was thinking more of uh, maybe communities who want to live uh, in a certain way. Uh, you've kind of seen this in the past where they would go off and, and start uh, kind oh, of like cults. Uh, well, cults um, uh, are, you know, religious communities are even people who really value um, maybe, um, I mean, you like, like these intentional communities, uh, for example, where they grow their own food and uh, like, oh, the, okay. the, the, yeah, like yeah. the Amish uh, would be like an example. Um, the Amish plus technology to go to the moon. Yeah, it'd be kind of this really weird, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, poverty and high technology combination, but. Interesting. I think of like, I don't usually think of the good intention ones. So that's helpful. That's a good reminder that there are, there are good groups who just want to be on their own because they're you know, salt of the earth people who, who want to you know, raise goats and, and live off the land and, and be good to each other. I think of like Scientologists and Kool-Aid drinking cult leaders. So that's bad. Well, uh, the, the moon would be a bad place for recruitment since you don't have anybody to recruit. So it, it would definitely true, more of these But you also forms. couldn't really defect. You couldn't, couldn't defect, yes. Yes. <laughs> that, that would be like the ultimate uh, entrapment. That's true. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, I mean, that's a whole nother problem. Like on the earth, I mean, consider immigration is one thing, but really like you can go anywhere on earth for the most part. Right, like if, if I wanted to leave DC and live in Toronto, like I could just move to Toronto. I could move to Paris, like, well, maybe not during COVID, but like I could move, I could just move. But on the earth, it's a little different than like, the moon where I imagine there's only like so many, so many structures and, and so much development. That's tricky too, just like not being able to have change. Like, would there be travel on the moon? Would there be like a luxury line where you could go from one pole to the other to check out the, the ice? I, you would, you would hopeful, hope so at some point. Uh, I mean, a vacation liner? Initially, I think it'd be very, very uh, contained. But, yeah. you know, if it's kind of like any place. Uh, you, you have people wandering in the wilderness. They create a, a village and then eventually get an airport. <laughs> you know, it's kind of... Yeah, so it's kind of just like, you know, the more you're there, the more you settle and grow and, and sprawl. It's, it's going to be so interesting. I There aren't any currently like permanent habitable structures on the moon, are there? There's just rovers? Uh, yes, just nobody rovers. No, no buildings. Like humans, no buildings. Uh, in fact, uh, the amount of space infrastructure is probably, uh, in, in all of space, is probably something that could fit in, you know, uh, a medium-sized office building. <laughs> oh, wow. It's, yeah, just the, the effort alone to get, like, construction equipment to the moon. Getting, like, because I think about when, because I'm in green buildings and, and sustainability, I think of, like, construction site as well. And, like, the equipment that it takes uh, to just, like, number one, har harness the materials and then bring them to the site and construct them and it, it's like very it's like cranes and bulldozers and like clearly the picture behind you on your screen like the earth is not an e excuse me the moon is not an easy place to build on it's like rock hard so then you need to have like jackhammers and stuff and then you have to power it all so it has to be all electric equipment which the construction industry hasn't really figured out yet they still use natural gas that's going to be interesting too Luckily, though, for the most part, they have figured out how to do like zero waste construction. Uh, there are a lot of green building certifications that uh, 
that encourage almost 100% reuse of material. And so you can, like, they encourage locally sourced materials, which makes a lot of sense on the moon because like, where else are you gonna get stuff, right? You, I assume you'd build stuff out of like moon rock. <sighs> That'd be expensive. And then, um, and then for the other things, you just wanna reuse as much as possible. So they're really into like low waste or prefabricated so that you just like, build exactly what you need instead of having a lot of extra waste of the materials and like cutting things and throwing them out. So that'd be interesting too. It'd be like such an efficient building. It'd be impressive. Yeah. And it's not just, uh, you know, natural gas versus electric. Um, you also have the fact it's in vacuum, the extreme temperatures and the gravity is one seventh that of earth as well. So does that mean everything just has to be super heavy? Well, it needs to not depend on being uh, seven times heavier than it is. But it means that it's easier to carry stuff around to some extent. Well, how do the rovers not float? Like the picture behind you, the rovers are rolling on the ground. How do they do that? Um, it, it still has gravity. It's just one seventh of the earth. So if you weigh like uh, 100 pounds, then you would weigh like um, a one, well, um, you know, one seventh of that, which is what's one seven <laughs> let's pretend you weigh 70 pounds then you would weigh 10 yes yes thank you easy numbers <laughs> okay so it's not yeah it's not like a 10 pound person will float off the ground either but so does it matter does it matter then because they'll still oh, be on the ground you, you could imagine like a bulldozer for example um needing to get traction uh, from its weight oh. and so you know it kind of spins a lot more so some way to to, to think about that interesting but it also means your your construction material could um doesn't have to be as thick to support its weight but then you know if it's going to contain like air you know that's a whole new problem you don't have to think about that here on earth uh, the pressure difference between the inside and outside of a building yeah i guess the only place you have to think about that is like on an airplane sort of or or if you're in a tornado area <laughs> you have like a lot of uh cold uh, you know uh, yeah. Oh, I've never thought about that. Do building designers have to take in tornado areas? Do they have to think differently about building design? I, I don't think so. Other than make oh, okay. it cheap and quick to rebuild, maybe. No. <laughs> you want it to withstand. You want it to be strong and integral. Uh, Do, they yeah, have Do they have tornadoes on the moon? Uh, no tornadoes. No wind. Um, no wind. So That's right. You said that. Yeah. Well, that's good. You just really have to worry about those extreme temperatures. That's bananas. That's going to be so hard. Huh. And I mean, I guess it's been figured out because rovers can be on the moon. So the, all of those materials must be able to withstand the extreme temperatures, right? Well, that's true. Um, but, you know, I guess it's different having like a, uh, a robotic rover on the moon versus having like a, a which could probably extend, ex, uh, you know, handle a, a big temperature range than having like humans in a container and having to make sure they have oxygen and yeah. they don't die from carbon die. dioxide and then they get too hot then get too cold. Uh, so. Can Okay, another question. Can you see the lights like at nighttime when everyone has lights on in the United States? Like, can you see that from the moon? I don't know. I don't know. I'd, uh, that's a good question. Because I've seen... Like, I don't know how far away the pictures are taken, but like there are pictures of the earth where it's like, nighttime and the clouds are clear, but you can see like all of the dots across, like across the United States at least, and less so on other parts of the world that are less developed. But like when the moon is developed, will we be able to, to see when they have their lights on? Can we see it from earth? I, I think that'd be fantastic if we could. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who this whole people on the moon thing is very theoretical, abstract and hard to believe. But I think for a lot of people, when they start seeing lights on the moon and they can point to that and say, those are humans up there, that'd be a big mind shift. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't know if that's possible given the distance, but that would be fascinating. Yeah, even if we had like a little beacon or something, uh, you know, that, oh, yeah. uh, maybe a, a mirror where we could take some light from the, uh, the, one side of the moon and and uh, turn it to the other. Are people thinking about that? That's interesting. 
That would have to be a really big mirror, no? Yeah, no. I I I think it would be. Yeah. Hmm. Or lots of little ones. <laughs> you know. This is this is a lot of technology that I never heard of before. <laughs> but I mean, it's uh, a, a lot of it's untested, un undeveloped. So the future. Okay, so future is cool. Twenty twenty four goal is for humans on the moon. Is there a timeline for developing on the moon, like building buildings and like settling settlements? Not really. Um, the no. the plan is to do uh, kind of like a one uh, a trip a year, um, mm -hmm. and then in like uh, 2028, kind of get to the point where you can have like sustained operations. A lot of people are kind of um, un uncertain exactly what that means. Uh, is it going to be like the International Space Station where it's continuously occupied or uh, what does sustained operations mean? But uh, at some point, there will be humans continuously around and on the moon. Uh, my sons so cool. have uh, not lived a day that we haven't had a person in space since the International Space Station's been uh, occupied continuously since, I think, 2000 or... 1999 or something like that oh interesting that's a cool stat i don't think about the international space station very often either but that's cool too um so if it was safe and affordable would you go to space yeah totally i think that'd be neat i love traveling um and so we have my husband and i try and take like one big trip a year we didn't do anything last year because covid so that was boring but um yeah, we, we love to travel and see new things. I uh, would absolutely. I mean, can you imagine the view? I I just, and I also, are there sunrises and sunsets? Like I, I really love those. And I think that would be really cool to see. Beyond that, I imagine it's kind of like the, the lift of like traveling to New Zealand, right? It's a very long travel time. And so once you get to your destination, you want to spend a decent time there because the travel time is so long. I can only imagine the travel time to the moon or like into space is a pretty big commitment. So I would also want like some sort of destination, I think, or at least a an end point. They always say life's about the journey, but like, come on, travel is about the destination. So I want, I would want some sort of destination, I think. But yeah, absolutely. And then I have a one-year-old, so it'd have to be, um, have to have a seat for him too. Is it kid-friendly? Uh not yet, <laughs> but uh, hopefully at some point it, it will be. Um, okay, so just uh, really futuristic. Imagine you're 100 years out from here. We've set okay. up Mars. There's a well, high school. There's a high school class in Mars, uh, maybe like a xenon uh, type uh, thing, and the teachers uh, given them an assignment to go and um, put together stories or little facts or some type of report about what humanity was like before taking these next steps on the moon that ultimately led to this continuous journey of uh, expanding and developing in space. And so our high school student, Xenon, uh, you know, does a quick search on the interwebs and comes across Countdown to the Moon and sees this video. And uh, so, so what can you tell her that will help her get an A plus in that class? Hi, Zena. This is what's happening in 2021. The world is on fire, but people have hope that it will get better. Technology is advancing, but probably not as fast as it is 100 years from now. And there is still hope for the future that future generations of global citizens, universal citizens, uh, can you know, thrive and prosper. So that's that's what I'd say. How's that? Maybe a celestial citizens. So, oh yeah, <laughs> celestial citizens. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I definitely think she has an A plus in her future now. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you for having me. This was fun. I hope it. I hope it worked out for you. Have you a did. good rest of your interviews. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, you have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye.